En la vez pasada que estuvo Hans aquí, fue hace casi 20 años, eh, yo acababa de llegar al instituto y él acababa de prácticamente presentar su, su defensa de tesis. Sí. Compartimos una, una, pues una gran amistad desde un poco antes de eso, porque eh, trabajamos en momentos distintos, pero trabajamos con el mismo director de tesis. And uh, now let me uh, switch to English because although Hans speaks and understands uh, Spanish uh, really well, he's going to present his talk in English. So the, the title of his talk for today is The More Sentence and the Fitch Paradox in Dynamic Epistemic Logic. As some of you know, he's one of the pioneers of Dynamic Epistemic Logic. So again, it's a, a, a great pleasure to have him here today. So, uh, Hans, we're, we are uh, very grateful that you accepted to give this talk. Uh, ah, and, but, by the way, I'm especially happy to see uh, so many people from the, de la Facultad. Here, la Facultad is la Facultad de los Letras, but for Sofa Vos, la Facultad is la, la Facultad de Ciencias. De Limas y de, y de otros lados, gente haciendo computación. Muchas gracias. So, Hans, gracias. Uh, Now uh, we can switch to English and um, you can stop. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation, opportunity. And in particular, as I already mentioned, the uh, Institute in Carnavaca that was so kind to uh, uh, invite me, and Sergio, uh, with whom I'm collaborating in Mathematicas uh, at this moment. Uh, however, uh, this talk will be on the uh, form of philosophical uh, logical matters um, that have kept me busy for a while and uh, well, I'm delighted to present you some of those uh, matters. And as I thought you also mentioned, I'm, um, I'm working at the CNS in the France, um, in, in Nancy, which is somewhere east of uh, Paris. I've been working in France for since 2012, actually, so this, this is a date that will appear in uh, my talk. And before that, I was actually uh, in the um, uh, Instituto de Filosofía, in, in the Departamento de Filosofía in Sevilla. And before that, I was in New Zealand, uh, actually, well, in various places. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, and as you see, uh, I have an association in uh, Chennai, that used to be known as Madras, in, uh, in the south of India. Um, okay, and um, this should work, but, uh, but, no, talking about Nancy, uh, it's, it, I will talk about serious matters too, but I cannot help to uh, present some uh, matters for the general entertainment. It, it's known for a, a sort of flourishing period in its economy and also uh, culturally uh, around the year 1900 where there was the the the, the Art Nouveau uh, and um, so there's there's lots of beautiful buildings with these uh, this, well uh, colored glass uh, windows and this beautiful museum from that uh, era so uh, yeah, yeah so there are many reasons to uh, visit Nancy apart from uh, uh, academic matters however uh, talking about the academic matters and let us start by the more sentence um, P and not KP. So Moore is a philosopher from the start of the 20th century. He's actually better known for, um, well, for ethics than for, um, you might say, logic or uh, philosophy. Um, but of course, there are many connections uh, between both, particularly in deontic logic. And um, in a 1942, uh, somewhat later in his career, uh, work, he wrote, I went to the pictures last Tuesday, but I don't believe that I did, is a perfectly absurd thing to say. Although, what is asserted is something which is perfectly possible logically. Why is this absurd? Well, the absurdity, then you can go a bit back in his uh, own words, um, follows from the implicature that if you say something, you're supposed to believe what you say. So the picture is that asserting phi implies believing phi. Then this goes back, in fact, to a, a part of his ethics and going back to the, the early decades of um, the 20th century. 
as these matters interest me uh, quite a bit, I, I made some effort to uh, to retrace them uh, in the literature. And, and a great help, uh, by the way, for that is is the, the very well known book uh, Knowledge and Belief by Hintika, the, the well known Finnish philosopher who devoted an entire chapter to exactly this uh, subject matter. <coughs> Now this should work. But, no. Okay, so let us have a look at this phrase. I went to the pictures last Tuesday, but I don't believe that I did. Um, let us formalize the proposition. Uh, I went to the pictures last Tuesday by P. We're going to do this in propositional logic. And um, in view of later matters that I will explain, we don't, well, we, we, we actually we merge belief and knowledge for the treatment of uh, today. It doesn't matter that they have uh, different properties. So I continue to write K for that. So then the formalization of I went to the pictures last Tuesday, but I don't believe that I did, is P and not KP. Yeah, so we read the but simply as a conjunction of two parts. And the absurdity has to do with binding this conjunction by the K operator. So we have K of P and not KP. So what I would say these days, you would say that this is inconsistent. Um, in, in, in fact, uh, Moore could also have said that, but he, uh, well, he had good reason to mount this as an implicature, uh, because then actually what you're saying is not inconsistent, P and not KP, but only what follows from this by some uh, further analysis uh, that is more into pragmatics, you could say. So therefore, he preferred not to call P the K of P and not K P inconsistent. Um, okay. Um, well, um, finding myself in an audience uh, with many logicians, I should give at least some analysis of the logical features of this inconsistency. Um, and it's interesting that there are actually two ways to do this, and um, which reveals. Um, actually a difference between the notions of knowledge and the notions of belief. And um, so this is one way to uh, reveal that inconsistency. So starting out with K of P and not KP, we uh, distribute the knowledge operator over the conjunction. So we get K, KP and K of not KP. And then there is this so-called property of, of uh, that you know what you know, called positive introspection of knowledge which means that from KP you can get KKP, and you distribute the knowledge operator once more, and, um, well, there we are. We have K of something that is a formula in its negation, which is an inconsistency, and knowledge of an inconsistency is, well, subject to at least uh, one condition of, of uh, seriality, that, that, which here means that, that, that anything bound by this operator is, is consistent, <laughs> equal to uh, inconsistency. So, okay, so that's one analysis. However, we note that this uses a property uh, of um, knowledge. Um, oops. That would be spectacular, right? Throwing my cough on this is someone's tea. Oh, uh, yes. yeah, See. that's my tea. Uh, so okay, I will be coffee. Well, that's throwing tea. I, is better I than throwing didn't coffee. try it. That's throwing <laughs> coffee is always worse. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you, here's your coffee. <clears throat> okay, this is another proof. Um, we distribute the K operator over the conjunction, and we now use property of belief, actually, that, uh, that it these properties of introspection hold for belief, so we can remove this uh, uh, K operator. Um, so that what you know is true is property of knowledge. But if, if you that you believe in your ignorance, from which it follows that ignorance is property of belief. So this is an effect of weaker but derivable property of uh, belief. And we now have a simpler way to uh, derive this uh, contradiction. Okay, so there are different ways to uh, to show that K of P and not KP is inconsistent. Um, let me point out that the, the way in which I prove these is really using what I would call to say uh, properties of the static logic. So I didn't 
needs any uh, well, dynamic stuff which is going to occur in the, in the continuation of my story. Mm -hmm. um, the dynamic stuff is more what happens if you get new information and you may want to change your knowledge or belief in, of something into something else. Um, and, and these analyses go back indeed to the time of uh, Hintika, the 1960s, and this was before such dynamic analysis of knowledge and belief well, became more common. Yeah, or at least to do this um, in the in the logical language and not mainly on a on a, a theoretical level investigating properties of uh, the change of knowledge. Yes. Hey Hans, you seem to have shown that it is inconsistent for somebody with enough introspection to believe that. Yes. But do we have a static proof for somebody without such a good introspection? Uh, no, no. In, in fact, Rick Restall has a nice uh, uh, proof uh, that without, uh, uh, for example, distributing, the, well, not without, but without some known properties of knowledge and belief, you would not uh, derive that inconsistency. Yeah. No, no. So it's, it's in, you have to load uh, this analysis with a lot of, uh, well, prejudice, so to speak, for the, what the properties of knowledge and belief are. But, Yes, there are many uh, other and possibly far more interesting logics that don't have those properties. Yes. Yeah. So anyone feel free to interrupt me at any stage uh, for, uh, for questions, particularly that kind of question. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> um, okay. Ah. Um, there, there's reason for this because it's, it, it leads up to the next example. Um, now, well, I recognize this, but this is the Cathedral of Sevilla, um, or, uh, well, uh, formerly known as the Great Mosque of Sevilla, but it's still the same uh, building. Uh, indeed, one of the most spectacular things you can see uh, in Europe. But, yeah, apart from the Alcazar in Granada. But, yeah, yeah. Or Alhambra in Granada. Yeah. Um, why did I show this? Um, well, Next example. Um, I gave this talk in Sevilla too, but in a different form, but the example goes back to that. So suppose I well, tell you, you don't know that there was ice in Sevilla in 2012, right? like, like frost, low temperatures. I was told it can happen in, in, in Mexico City too, but it's uncommon, right? It, but it's possible. And but not every year. So maybe you didn't know that it was ice in the early 2012. So I've informed you of this fact. Maybe I do something wrong. Well, this one is true. And so, okay, so now you know. Now, suppose I say you, tell you again, you don't know that there was ice in the early 2012 having just informed you already once of this fact. Um, well, do I break some pragmatic um, rule here? Is this possible? No, it's not possible, right? Yeah. And, and why is it not possible? Because now you do know yes. uh, the, the, the announcement is unsuccessful. Exactly, yeah, thank you. So this is exactly what is the case. So if, if you say it's twice, it will be a lie, yeah, because you have already been informed. Yeah. But, but I think it's pretty common, right? In reality, that you forgot that you told the other person this fact. No, but here in, in this sort of analysis, we all mistreat treating with perfect logicians. <laughs> 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 so nobody forgets anything. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, this is an assumption that one does not have to make, but anything I say today is, is, uh, is for perfect logicians. Yeah. Or at least perfectly rational beings. Yeah. Um, it is possible, right? I mean, if there was not ice in Sevilla in 2012, you still don't know because this false. Yeah, that, that's a good point. So if, if the first sentence was a lie, no, but if the first sentence was a lie, then the would, well, they would you, you, you're right. So the first sentence could have already been a lie. Yeah, yeah. That would make the analysis of the second sentence somewhat complex because uh, it would still be pragmatically problematic 
if you were talking to the same person, because then that would imply that you didn't believe him in the first place. So, which is also a bit uh, problematic. Yeah. But no, you're right. Or at, at least as proof of concept, uh, there was ISIS in 2012. Do you take that picture? No. <laughs> actually, actually, it's not in Sevilla, but in Florida. <laughs> so it's a lie too. But, <laughs> I, no, I have I have better proof of concept, not for that year, but for other years. Um, this one. This is proof of concept. At least that that it can freeze in Sevilla. Yeah. I wasn't around. Well, I was around in that year, but not in Sevilla. Nineteen sixty-seven. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah? Los cuatro bajo cero en Sevilla. Sí. Es mucho. <laughs> no, yeah, they, 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 it's, so it's possible. Yeah. But it, it, well, I, I lived four years there. It, it, I suppose two out of four years it was um, possible. No. The, the, the interesting aspect why I lived is so on the day of my departure from Sevilla, I was first in Sevilla. Um, and this creates a problem because there's an airport in Sevilla and they don't have machinery to treat uh, airplane wings uh, against uh, ice. So we had to wait five hours for the sun. To, uh, it was an early morning flight, of course, 6 a.m. And we had to wait five hours before the departure. And um, um, well, the, the other interesting aspects of my departure in Sevilla was not by myself. Really, but I bought another seat in the plane for a Mr. Violoncello, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's where I could transport my uh, my cello as well on that, on that day from Sevilla. But yeah, so fortunately the plane went. But there is ice in Sevilla. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the other interesting aspect is the price of these apartments in the uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mercedes, which would be like in the order of fifty thousand euros, uh, which you would no longer be able to buy anything for in Sevilla. <laughs> Certainly not in that uh, area. Yeah. So, Hans, about the example, yeah. there are many phrases that you can only say truthfully once. Yes. Uh, is there something more to it that you want us to look at? Well, the thing that interests me in this example, for, well, in, in, in such phrases, is when you model these in a modological language, if there's a syntactic characterization of such phrases, that, that, that tells you whether you can only say them once or whether they hold forever. And, and in fact, for um, and this is an open question. Yeah. So, so there's some tech, well, we will get to those technical questions. Uh, at least, if you'll excuse me for the, I'm, 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 I'm trying to take advantage of the knowledge that I can talk for one and a half hour. Well, not really, but I don't have to speed it up uh, completely, right? So I can present this at some leisure. Yeah. Yeah, but we will get to some uh, answers to more technical questions on such matters later. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let us analyze this particular example, and here we get into what I would call the dynamic aspect of uh, the analysis. Um, <coughs> first, if you say you don't, well, you don't know that there was ice in Sevilla, as as is an analysis, this is not a conjunction, it's just a negation of knowledge, right? But the, the, the typical implicature of uh, such a thing is that you inform the other person that of what that other person don't know, that that proposition is in fact true. So if the proposition P is there was ice in Sevilla, then the analysis of this is not not KP, but P and not KP. There, yeah, at least by, by uh, you might say, by conversational implicature. Now, uh, a difference that is important um, at this stage of the analysis is that um, here there is nothing problematic at all because um, it's not a statement you do about your own knowledge. No, you're informing another person of that person's ignorance. And there is nothing but inconsistent about me knowing that another person is ignorant. So this is a, a difference. Um, however, um, let us see uh, now what the dynamic aspect is. So we have that 
on the assumption yeah, that the announced proposition was true and not a lie at the moment of the announcement, P and not KP is true. And having been informed of P, yeah, the address agent knows P, KP. And then by a very, very simple propositional almost process, we have no, not almost propositional process, we can weaken this into not P or KP, which is equivalent to not P or not not KP. So it's a negation of the formula that's being announced. So if you announce P and not KP, then after that, this formula is false. So this is the, the, the funny uh, aspect of this analysis. Yeah. By announcing something, you make it false. So much for uh, the more sentence. Now I'm, I'm switching to a related topic. However, these topics are not necessarily uh, uh, analyzed simultaneously as related, and they're often seen as very different topics, partly because the moral sentence was traditionally more seen as something about belief, and the Fitch paradox is paradox of knowledge. But uh, in what I will say, they can be treated uh, on, on, on the same foot. Um, okay, here we have a nice uh, statement, and uh, take your time in reading this bit. Um, it, it's a review from a, a journal article submission, but going a bit back in time, eh, before uh, we did these things in front. I can, uh, it, it, I hope the resolution is uh, okay. I, I will read it to you uh, from uh, this moment uh, onwards. <coughs> For let K be a true proposition which is unknown to A at time T. A is the name of an agent. And let K prime be the proposition that K is true but unknown to A at time T. Then K prime is true. And so you have the P and not KP. Um, but it would seem that if A, if agent A, no k prime at time t, then, and here we get into the, 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 the inconsistency analysis that we have seen, but it would seem that if a knows k prime at time t, then a must know k at time t, and must also know that he doesn't know k at time t. By definition 2, in the submission, this is a contradiction. Okay, this is exactly what I've started out my talk with today, um, but in, uh, you might say, uh, somewhat historical eyes. Um, well, is there anyone who recognizes this handwriting? No, that, that's, that's a joke. This is difficult, right? <laughs> uh, uh, it's Alonso Church. Um, and it, no, it was, I, I know this guy, Joe Salerno, who, uh, who discovered this manuscript and by handwriting analysis discovered that this must have been an anonymous review, <laughs> because that's a <laughs> review star, by Alonso Church. Yeah, really, yeah, isn't that nice? Yeah. And, um, um, and, and yeah, it's wonderful to read this. Um, so, so in the analysis I've shown, the, 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 the Proposition now is the one called K, the agent is called A, so we have K and not uh, A knows K. And K prime is called the conjunction, so that knowledge of K prime is uh, the K, well, it should be KA, of uh, K and not, uh, not A uh, K. And so this is the inconsistent uh, phrase. Yeah. Um, so if you're really famous in, China, in science, you get cited for your anonymous referee reports. To the, the submission of Frederick Fitch, that is, in the, the US uh, magician, uh, a definition of value in 1945, yeah, which was finally published in 1963. Um, yeah. you, you might say, well, sometimes it can take a while before uh, your submissions uh, make it, but don't <laughs> give up hope. <laughs> what's, what's a mere 18 years? Yeah. Okay. What is this Fitch paradox? It's this. 
Um, the Fitch paradox is that, well, as it says here, some unknown truths are in fact unknowable. So, well, um, at least let's put a bit of formalization there. It's, it's dangerous because here I'm putting some formulas without giving any semantics, right? But it uses familiar things like, uh, well, counters and, and, and implications, so it suggests it means something. Yeah. So there is a P, such as P and not KP, is saying that there is an unknown truth. There is a P that is not known, so there is an unknown truth. And for all Q, Q implies diamond KQ, um, is supposed to formalize everything is known. Where, where diamond KQ is like there is some process after which I know Q. Okay? So knowable is uh, getting to know. The getting to is the diamond. Okay, so what do we have? Uh, we start with uh, Q implies diamond KQ or Q. So in particular, it holds for Q is P and not KP. So we get P and not KP implies diamond of K, P and not KP. So on condition that there is an unknown truth, namely and that that one is P and not KP, we get the conclusion diamond K of P and not KP. Now assuming that, uh, well, diamond looks like more logic, right? So it's probably uh, something nice with semantics, who knows? So there must be some semantics for this, but as it's a diamond, it's something existential. So we should get to some state where we can evaluate k of p and not kp, and then you're in trouble. Okay, because then we have the analysis we have seen for more sentence. Okay. Um, so the, yeah, the, the history of the Fitch paradox is interesting. So, so the idea that everything is no true, that it can be known, it, it came about a bit later than the idea that, that everything that is uh, true can be proved. Yeah? So there's some relation with uh, logical positivism in, in, in Vienna, in the Wiener Kreis, and, and, and the, the Bible incompleteness proof, because that is about provability, but not about knowability. And, and, and what we see here is that uh, the things, well, so, so it, it says in a way that P and not KP is not knowable because of some sort of self-referential nature that the thing that is true happens to refer to something uh, about knowledge. That is exactly the same as in, uh, in going on incompleteness because uh, there are many true things uh, uh, that uh, if the truth relates to uh, being able to prove something, then you cannot prove that. Yeah? So this diagonalization in, in Bergel's incompleteness is a bit related if you take a big jump uh, to this knowability uh, uh, stuff. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad nobody uh, strongly objects at this moment, because then I would be at a complete loss uh, for words, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. Um, so here we get to uh, the postulate of success. I think she told me she liked that this appeared in my talk. Yeah. Um, well, what is this postulate of success? It has to do with belief revision. And so you believe or know a number of things and you get new information. Um, there is a sort of an expectation that this new information is incorporated in the things you already know or believe, in your, your knowledge base, just like that. So that it's successful to integrate this new uh, knowledge into the things you already know. And, and, um, <coughs> and, and the Fitch uh, paradox of knowability demonstrates that this is not always the case. And now, what the possibility of success is not something about modal logic, or at least uh, not necessarily. It was uh, a big thing in... in what is known as, as AGM belief revision, uh, Alturon, Gartenforce, and so um, So there are ways to view this as, as, in, in, as modal logic. Yeah. Um, in fact, it was Christa Segerberg who made some of the first moves to, uh, to retranslate this belief revision, well, traditional style, into some uh, modal logical setting. Yeah, it's a Swedish uh, position. Um, so, how do we translate uh, success in more logic? Well, um, it could say something like uh, phi implies diamond exclamation mark phi k phi. What does this mean? If phi is true, 
the red part like means then after announcing phi, then after uh, well, incorporating phi in your uh, knowledge base, uh, phi is not. What was fictional ability? Well, it was a bit similar. It says if phi is true, then, uh, then blah blah k phi. Well, blah blah is still a bit unclear, but that means knowable. Okay? Diamond k phi. If phi is true, then there is a way after which phi is known. Let us now make this a bit more precise by saying that there is an announcement after which phi is known. And now we can think a bit closer to, um, well, a logic that uses this exclamation mark operator, which is a logic known as the logic of public announcements. Um, so fixed paradoxes that not all formulas are knowable, but a particular example is that not all formulas are successful in the sense that after announcing them, they may no longer be true. Okay. Um, here we get into the structures. Um, the one... Um, let me try it again. No, it really doesn't work. Um, just look at this one. One, zero, in a bar. Um, it, it represents a curve model, a very simple one. There's a one state where P is true, there's a zero state where P is false, and the agent cannot distinguish them. Therefore, there's a, they are connected. Okay? So this represents one uh, bar zero, uncertainty about the truth of P. Underlined one means that and really P is true. We need a, a, a point of evaluation. Um, okay, given that P is true, and the agent is uncertain about P. After announcement of P, we get to a state where P is true and no, the uncertainty has disappeared. I, I could give a, a big story on how this works, but we're not going to be bothered. Announcements means model uh, reduction. And here we have a, a model consisting of two states, and then you reduce it to one of a single state. Well, on the right hand side, there's no alternative, so P is true and P is known. On the left hand side, P is unknown, but this exclamation mark operator transforms the left hand side model into the right hand side model, and, and this relation is actually the interpretation of this um, diamond operator with exclamation mark P. Therefore, on the left hand side, you can say after announcing P, the agent knows P. Or, on the left-hand side, you can say, there is a way to get to know P. And so then the diamond um, quantifies over, over announcements, and, and announcing P is one way to make that announcement. Is that clear? This is uh, important. Yeah. Okay. Other example, P and not KP. Now, what happens if you announce P and P is not known in the same structure? The way to process these, well, essentially programs, uh, transforming the states of knowledge, is to, well, compute for each point in the structure whether that formula is true or false. In which point of the structure that represents uncertainty about P, uh, one, slash zero, is P and not KP true? Okay, let's first go for one. That's what P is true. P not KP is a conjunction. So the P part of the conjunction is true. Now the not KP part, is that true or false in the one world? Well, yeah, indeed. So the not KP part says the agent doesn't know P, it says there is a world or a state accessible where P is false. Well, that is also the case because you can go from one to zero. And so in the one world, P and not KP is true. Now we go to the other state, zero. Is P and not KP true there? No, because P is false. 
and, and piece of conjunction, so it's definitely not true there. Okay, so that means that if we restrict the two worlds, two states, structure to those where P not cap P is true, we end up with the single one where P is true, and we have again the same transition. Okay, so for this particular formula, the, the, the transformation okay, after announcing that P is true is the same as the transformation after announcing P and not P is true. But Apart from that, now there is a difference, because the difference is that the formula P and not KP is true on the left-hand side, but false on the right-hand side. But then it's just standard, well, mechanics, semantics of, of uh, cryptomon. Okay. So, in a way, this is, a, you might say, a, a counterexample for, um, well, the validity of these uh, formula schemata okay? um, and where the first one these says that, well if p and okp is true then after announcing it it is known so, so no, this is uh, therefore wrong and the second one is then done in terms of knowability but where the witness of the diamond is indeed the announcement p and okp okay Well, on, on these two examples, I'm going to build the rest of my uh, presentation. Only from here on, it gets uh, actually a bit uh, more technical, but uh, well, I hope to get uh, them eventually uh, to uh, explain some results based on, on, on this logic. And they sh this should be more intuitively uh, understandable. Um, so, um, there is a logic wherein um, you have this diamond as an operator. It is a novel propositional logic. It has epistemic modalities for knowledge, which are the necessity type uh, uh, model logic uh, 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 thing. And it has these public announcements, but it also has these uh, diamonds that function like quantifiers. So diamond phi is true. If and only if there's a formula phi that you can announce after which phi is true. Good. So we have the diamond exclamation mark psi phi. Um, where it says epistemic psi. So there's a restriction. And the restriction is that this psi doesn't contain uh, diamonds. We will see why this is necessary. And, uh, and so the second, well, paraphrase of the uh, first. Uh, schema is that there is a model restriction such that the post condition phi is true in the restriction. And the model restriction is like a transformation from a two-state to a one-state thing. And as an example of, uh, of something in this logic, before I present it uh, uh, more formally, uh, we have that, uh, well, um, diamond kp or k not p is uh, a validity of this logic. Why is that so? Um, well, without looking at the explanation here, I can't even try to intuitively uh, uh, reveal this. So, if you have a given structure in the point of evaluation, um, the variable p must be either true or false. Right? There's only two possibilities, even in model logic. Um, if it's already known to be true, your work is done. Because then after the trivial announcement, it's still not. So you have diamond uh, KP. Yeah. Um, if it's not known to be true, well, you can announce P. So then there is an announcement, namely P, after which P is known. So you have also diamond KP. The other option is that it's false. If it was already known to be false, well, you uh, make a trivial announcement and it's still remains known to be false. Or you announce that it's false, and then you restrict the model to uh, all the states where it's, it's false, and, well, again, it is known to be false. So whatever happens in any model, whatever the value of p in the state of evaluation, I can do something to get to know p. So, um, diamond kp or diamond k not p. First, I don't know whether 
Initially, this was clear not happy, but one of the two must be the case. Well, this really explains what I have already explained before um, in the same way. Um, okay. Now, this is a mere example about one variable p. What, what is interesting in model logic, if you have validities that are schematic in the sense that it's not for an atomic proposition p, but for uh, any formula phi. So the, from here on, I'm going to work towards demonstrating that we do not really have diamond kp and k not p, but we even have diamond k phi or k not phi for any formula phi. And then this formula can contain knowledge modalities, it can be about multiple agents, it can be about diamonds, so this is a more general result. Okay. It's unavoidable, this is top of logic, right? So this is the, the one where uh, syntax semantics uh, ban. Um, but the idea was, I have many examples. We do not dwell maybe too much on the details, but this is what details are. So the logic is a model logic with knowledge modalities, public announcement modalities, and boxes yeah, that stand for quantification of announcements. And the structures are Kripke models. And, and in fact, Kripke models with a point of evaluation. And also, in fact, Kripke models with uh, accessibility relations to interpret the modalities that are equivalence relations. Okay? So this is the standard correspondence between knowledge modalities and equivalence relations. Okay, uh, having said that, the interpretations of all the inductive constructs are uh, standard. P is true if, well, S is an evaluation of P. That stands for P being true. The subset of the domain where P is true. Okay. Not phi is true if it's not the case that phi is true. Conjunct is true if both conjuncts are true. Okay, so the, 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 this symbol stands for the it is true that or a satisfaction symbol. <clears throat> and um, what I also did not say, but I uh, should say, so if we, for example, look at the very first clause, n comma s satisfies p, then n comma s represents such a pointed critical. So that is the unit of evaluation that I'm talking about here. Um, then we have the typical model construct that the agent knows phi <coughs> in the state of S, if in all accessible states T, phi is true. So if in all T in the domain of the structure, if T is accessible by from S for agent A, then phi is true in T. The public announcement is interpreted by using not internal relations in a structure, but by transforming the structure. Um, in, in, well, I, I'd say in similar fashion as uh, with Armand and Sergio, I'm having many discussions on transforming uh, other structures, like simplicial complexes, but you can do this with pretty honestly. Yeah. Then we have public announcements. Um, so after announcing phi psi, is true if on condition of the truth of the announcement phi in but model restriction to the phi states uh, skip details psi is true box phi is true if it's true after every announcement yeah if after any psi phi then we have box phi there's restriction all epistemics psi we can now see why we need to have a restriction Suppose we were not to have a restriction here and it would be any formula psi. What would go wrong? <clears throat> I can tell you, but it's easier to find a suggestion. Yeah. What would go wrong if it was not, if this could be any formula in the language? Then, then, then there's a problem with this definition, this, this semantics. Yeah. It could be a repetition of boxes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it, that's more or less what I mean. So if there's no restriction, this could be the formula box phi that we're trying to interpret. So it would be a circular definition. Yeah. So we need to do something to avoid circularity. Yeah. Yeah. 
You, you, you can put a lot of things here, but you don't want to put box phi here because you're trying to give meaning to that, uh, that uh, well, in, inductive construct in, in the semantics. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I don't want to say too much about this logic, but maybe to uh, give some credentials that I'm really working in an institute for theoretical computer science. So we can do things that are related to, uh, to uh, what, what people sometimes do. Uh, um, well, at least we want to know that this is an axiomatizable logic. So there is indeed an axiomatization. Um, <coughs> however, it's, it's um, an infinite re-axiomatization. It, it has a derivation rule with an infinite number of uh, premises in order to draw a conclusion. But you can guess what the rule is. If after any announcement, sorry, it's true, then box, well, no, if, yeah, if after any announcement, psi is uh, all are derivable, then box psi is derivable. Okay? So infinite number of premises, namely for any announcement, any epistemic formula announcement. Um, it is actually um, still an open question whether there is a, you might say, a standard finite theory for what exponentization. <clears throat> um, these are a number of things you can do in this logic. So if after any announcement phi and psi is true, well, then both, uh, then after any announcement phi is true, and then after any announcement psi is true. Well, that, that you buy just like that, right? This is obvious. If after any announcement phi is true, then phi was already true. Why is this? Well, you can say things like p or not p. Okay? So you can do the trivial announcement. Okay? Then you return the structure you already had. So phi must then have been true already. Um, box phi implies box box phi. This is a schema that must look familiar to anyone who has done logic of knowledge. Then we, we, if we revert it, you get diamond diamond phi plus phi. What does it say? Well, there is an announcement. Well, if there is an announcement, after which you make another announcement, and then uh, phi is true, then I can do this in a single announcement. And um, what is that single announcement? Well, in this logic, we can, it, 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 we can combine anything in the announcement, right? So the single announcement is, the first announcement is true after the first announcement, the second announcement. And so, yeah. So this is a way to combine two announcements into a single one. Okay, then there's one um, um, that looks like, um, I have to think about the direction. This is the church ross direction, right? Yeah, so this says if I make have a structure and I make an announcement and I make a completely different announcement, then I have a submodel here and I have a submodel here. Okay, if that is so, then there should be some way to reach the intersection of these two submodels. There's a way to close the diamond. Well, to show the proposition, you do not do exactly that, but you show that if you have a submodel here and a submodel there, then either way you can reach something such that the result is bisimilar to that intersection. <laughs> Maybe it's not exactly that, but bisimilar is good enough in, in the in the logic. Um, okay, there are more things to say about this. Um, which I will not say. Yeah. Then maybe I should really mention. So this de Lima is Thiago de Lima from uh, uh, Brazil, um, who at the time I got to know him um, was a PhD student in Toulouse with uh, Andreas Herzi right here, and I became his co-supervisor. And and this was not. Uh, well, fairly at the beginning of his PhD period, so I mean, we were well thinking about okay, what what shall we uh, do? Uh, what would be a nice topic for the PhD thesis, right? So, well, yeah, wouldn't it be nice to quantify over announcements? So it, it became the topic of his PhD thesis. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he is now a uh, an assistant professor in uh, in uh, Lens. This is near uh, Lille in the north of France. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. 
I still have some time. Well, we are planning to finish at 2 o'clock. It's 1.20. Oh, already? And, and, and it would be nice to get questions. So could you finish in 15 minutes? Is it possible? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. easy. If that is fine, yeah. So, on the next, on this uh, part, I'm now going to, uh, well, make the link you know, between, you might say, the, the methods more of philosophical, logical analysis that I started out with, going back into the history of uh, uh, logic, and, and uh, the, the logic of um, arbitrary public announcements that I just presented. You know, because some of the, the issues can now be well, made formal, can be made formal in this logic, and then you can investigate some of the properties. Um, so for this, um, one fragment of uh, synthetic fragment of the logic um, is uh, what I call here the positive uh, formulas, um, which in the first order logic you would call the universal a universal fragment, or maybe the universal fragment. It it does it forbids negations before boxes. And what is the advantage of such a fragment? Well, the universal formulas remain true after moral restriction. Okay? Existential formulas, well, maybe their truth depends on a point that you remove, bang, from a moral restriction. So they cause trouble. Universal, universal things never cause trouble. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, in, in your one. In, in no logic, uh, boxes are forever, diamonds are not forever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, a semantic way of, well, saying this, not exactly, as we will see, but somehow, is to look at the schema phi implies box phi, which says that if phi is true, then after any model restriction, phi remains true. Ah. You see there's some connection with, with universal formulas here, right? Yeah. Um, then successful is another semantic notion that says that after announcing formula phi, it remains true. And this is always the case. So, so this is the link to um, AGM belief revision and the possible of success. So the, the successful formulas are the formulas that can always be successfully incorporated. And then knowable is the schema we have seen. Phi implies diamond Ka phi. Phi is true, then you can get to know phi. And what can we observe about these fragments? Well, we can observe that the positive formulas, the universal fragments, are preserved. The only mystique in that is the negation we see here, because weren't negations disallowed? Well, but <coughs> that's a mere uh, feature instead of a problem of the semantics of public announcement, because if we write out the semantics of public announcement on condition of the truth of uh, the announcement in the model description this or that, if you write this implication in disjunctive form, it becomes this disjunction, and you can prove this by some induction that is on the structure of these formulas, but for all models, including all model restrictions. So look, it's, it, it's, uh, it's, after all, very positive and universal. Um, that the preserved formulas are successful is easy to show, because if phi remains true after any announcement, then it's particularly after the announcement of phi itself, and that happens to be equivalent to this scheme. Um, then we can show that the successful formulas are also knowable because, um, well, of some equivalence that is in the first step that then implies that we can replace the diamond announcement phi by the, the diamond itself. Um, having, well, shown some of these implications, they are not equivalences between these notions because um, even though positive formulas are successful, some successful formulas are not positive. If I simply tell you, uh, you don't know that P, but without the implicature that P is true, well, then, then I still don't know that P. So that's a successful uh, announcement. 
And also some notable formulas are not successful because, um, well, that I know something about your ignorance. Um, that is knowable because I can, can be, uh, after, well, after the trivial announcement, I can uh, still put the K operator in front of that formula. So there's a way for me to get to know this in, in trivial sense. There are also non-trivial examples. Bien. Um, there are some more complex questions you can ask yourself about such methods. For example, to, to, uh, to, uh, to characterize instead of syntactically describe hmm, all formulas that after being announced remain true. Um, a very elegant way to do this was by uh, Wes Holiday and Thomas Eckhart, presented uh, a while ago. And this involves doing things that are related to uh, how you know disjunctive and conjunctive normal forms and propositional logic, but then use their equivalents in modal logic um, and, well, use these as enumerations of anything that can be uh, said or known about such formula. So you, you <laughs> rewrite this into some standard uh, normal form and then you prove things about this normal form. Um, however, for the multi agent case, this has been an open question. This doesn't necessarily mean that this is exceptionally hard. It may be even mean that the question is no longer in the center of focus of interest of the community. At least I would like to uh, show this, but I do not know anyone who has done this. Um, then in getting to the knowable formulas, so you could also ask yourself about the characterization of uh, the formulas that are knowable. Um, Let's, uh, to, uh, to close this uh, presentation, let's look at a number of, well, alternative views on this number. So the number two is the schema that we have seen. Phi implies diamond K phi. And as we already know from uh, Frederick Fitch, this will be problematic, right? Not everything is known. But is there a different form in which we can, uh, well, present this in which it were possible that everything is known. Um, well, you could make it even stronger, this is version one, and it should not merely be the case that anything that is true, uh, well, uh, can become known to be true, but it should even be the case that anything that is false can become known to become false. Um, <coughs> If it holds for any fine one and two are equivalent, right? That's not a no big difference. So that will be equally problematic. Or maybe you can make it weaker. So either for a formula, if it's true, uh, then you can get to know that it's true, or if it's false, you can get to know that it's false. Actually, the Morris sentence is an example of that, because its negation is knowable in a standard sense. Hmm? The modal sense was P and not KP. So the negation is not P or you know that P. Uh, that is no. Um, however, this, well, that's a disjunction and one has a phi part and the other is a not phi part, right? If I spell this out, there's a, there's a part phi or not phi, so it's true. So three is not a good idea. Well, final suggestion, dying, so, Maybe yeah, there's always a way to get to know phi, to get to know not phi. Diamond K phi or diamond K not phi. This seemed an interesting schema to well, to me, to us, to the people I uh, worked with uh, on this matter. And um, the first standard one you could call that's noble. Yeah, for everything you can get to know that. Well, you can get, you can learn that it is uh, uh, true. And the other part I call weather novel. Yeah. For everything you can find out whether uh, it is known. That's whether, you know, whether five, you know, that five, you know, that not five. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's the same, yeah. So that good, so that see. It's the same in uh, French. Um, not all languages have this distinction. Yeah. Um, so, this weather sense of diamond K5 or diamond K not 5 
that can be shown. I don't want to give the proof, but what you do is that if you have given formula phi, as it is a formula, it contains a finite set of propositional variables, and you, uh, you announce the value of all the variables occurring in that formula. This is a model transformation. In the resulting model, all those variables are therefore uniformly true or uniformly false. And in a model where in variables are uniformly true or uniformly false, any formula only using those variables that is true is model validity. So it's not only true in the point, that it's true everywhere. Um, but <coughs> if, if such a formula yeah, is then a model validity, then knowledge of this formula is also model validity. So we announce all variables. In the model restriction to the variables in phi, uh, well, phi is not really true or false, but it's valid in the model, or not phi is valid. Therefore, k phi or k not phi, then we have the scheme. There are various remaining questions, such as um, given the logic I have shown with epistemic modalities, public announcement modalities, quantifiers. And you can actually cut out the public announcement modalities because the quantifier it was like uh, box phi is true if after any announcement psi phi is true. But this was equivalent to box phi is true if, um, if in any uh, restriction of the model to a psi phi is true. That is formulation without using that announcement terminology. So the same language without the public announcement uh, modality, but has a semantics that would definitely lead to uh, the same validities on that language restriction. However, if you define language with that restriction, I can no longer give the axiomatization, except in a trivial way that knowing the axiomatization of the full language, well, it's just the intersection of, uh, of all those uh, theorems with the, the sub-language, but that, that's a bit silly. <coughs> and, and it seems very, uh, actually, an elegant variant because it goes more directly back to Fitch, for example, but uh, no, well, nobody knows how to do this. And that, that actually still definitely seems a relevant question to answer. Yeah, um, Yeah. so there are more things you can do. I think it's time to, uh, to sort of uh, stop. Um, there are relations with things like knowledge transfer yeah, so the, the Fitch paradox was, if it's true, if you can get to know it. Well, knowledge transfer is like if A knows it, is there a way for B uh, to get to know it? Um, there's a relation with what you could call knowledge diffusion. So if the, well, if the information is available in the system, that is, if the agent has distributed knowledge of fine, is there a way to get to know it? Is there a way such that by communication, afterwards uh, it is common knowledge? Right? So that is D phi implies dynamic C phi. C is for its common knowledge different. Then there is a relation to what I know as epistemic planning. Right? Then we remove the K operator and we have the, the, the schema phi implies diamond psi. Given initial conditions phi, then uh, can you make a plan, uh, a, a protocol, a procedure to realize uh, psi, where psi is some goal, an epistemic goal? Um, that was about it. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Hans. Now we have uh, plenty of time for questions. Uh, you can raise your hand. I'll just. Right. Right. Um, who's next? David, please. Uh, public announcement logic is synchronous. Have you done any work on how this would change when you have it synchronous? Well, yes. Thank you for this interesting question. Um, I would say the public announcement logic is thought to be synchronous, but actually, this is not. You can have a different view of that. Um, however, that means that you have to. Uh, um, 
to reason of histories of announcements, where histories of different length um, can actually mean the same uh, step in time, or, or you, you might say indistinguishability here uh, from, from a concurrent point of view. So there are, there are ways to view a public announcement project asynchronously. Yeah. Um, and a person who, who wrote on that um, um, is Andreas Witzel, who at that time was a student of, of Christoph Pachts. Um, however, these results are not very well known, and, and my, my current main interest is to, to investigate asynchronous ways of viewing the dynamic extent watches. Um, and, and in fact, that's the reason I'm here uh, being hosted by Sergio. Yeah. So, uh, then I could say a lot more, but that would be a short answer to your very relevant uh, question. Thank you. Okay, and uh, A very basic question. Uh, you're not only talking about ideal agents, you're also talking about ideal announcements. Not the normal way that we talk about them. Like, for instance, in a game, when people don't make any mistakes, when they announce that they have certain cards. Uh, so, is it okay to think? In all everything you said, that we're dealing with announcements that are reliable or known to be true, or is this some different twist on the notion of announcement? I think the historical reason to uh, what well, it, it seems a restriction on what you can do by requiring that announcement should be true, right? Well, this is a simplistic uh, model, but in fact, it's it's a modeling assumption that makes sense because the logic of public announcement uh, models the, the, the knowledge change of an agent following the moment the agent has decided to accept the information. Mm -hmm. However, many other things are possible, but it, it is only that. So trust the announcement. Yes. Yeah. And, but even when you trust the information, is therefore apparently the case that there are complications, particularly involving self-reference to knowledge modalities and announcement modalities. Yeah. But public announcement logic is more than logic. That is the consequence of a possibly very long process, but following the final decision to accept and try to incorporate information considered reliable. Yeah. And beyond that, there are many other things you could also do, and that you could even do with uh, such logics, but they could be considered generalizations of such a more simple logics. Now, is there any case in real life of this uh, behavior where we have such a thing of, as trusted announcements? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, bank transactions, for instance, when in some system there's a presupposition that whatever information you get is reliable. I would say yes, because that's the normal way to uh, behave in life, right? So, you typically you trust, well, for me at least, if you, <laughs> suppose you have, like, anything that comes toward you, you have to consider the possibility that it can also be false or unreliable. You would, that, that would make it impossible to function. So, typically, uh, you accept anything coming towards you, but, yeah, no, you have to make exceptions. So, so it's more, more a logic of, well, you might say, uh, the, the typically productive uh, way of decision-making. You, you have to make a decision, right? Information, let's say you have to do something. Well, uh, maybe an easy abstraction is to believe anything that comes towards you. Then, if it turns out to be unwarranted, you can change your behavior. Okay, so we have 15 more minutes and at least sí. four more questions. So, sí, uh, la posibilidad de, de pedirme en, en español también, ¿no? Exacto. Sí, si sí. alguien quiere hacer su pregunta en español, eh, por favor, tome la oportunidad de hacer su pregunta. En francés también podemos hacer. Tú en francés, en holandés. Armando. So, uh, at the end of this talk, you mentioned this transfer of knowledge, uh, logic, or something like that. Right? Yeah. So, I don't know if we could go back to that slide. Yes. So that, that's very appealing to me because because it's it's kind of modeling these multi-agent systems and they 
like they are sending messages, right? Like that, that would be yeah, yeah, this is yeah. becoming distributed, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah I didn't like like think of that. Very, yeah. very distributed. Yeah. So this, this is more like point-to-point -point communication, or, or not? Like uh, because you have you have particular two agents there. Like uh, like if an agent knows something, eventually another agent will know that thing, right? This is like the meaning uh, of that. Uh, Yes. Okay. So my question is if there is some sort of war because in in, in the distributed system isn't is many the case many times the case that uh, if you know something is not not necessarily true that everybody will know that because there are many issues like uh, time and synchrony of failures. So I wonder if it would make sense in terms of logic that if I know something maybe it's, it's the case that not 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 necessarily everybody know that thing. So I my question is if there is something like that in, in this uh, regard. Um, yes. So in, in the first place, as you say, you can think of K A fine plus diamond K B fine um, as well. In, in the example we discussed a few days ago, like two agents uh, communicating. Uh, um, well, give, but we are giving a snapshot of the system for these two agents, right? Consulting memory, like uh, what was it? Uh, uh, writing snapshot. So, so it would describe the scenario where you have two agents. Uh, uh, well, interacting uh, with uh, memory and then um, uh, having communications by way of uh, interaction. Then, of course, as you also say, um, then there will be particular formulas of interest that you want to distribute, where the formula of interest phi would be here the, 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 the local state or some state variable for agent A. That A wants B to know that, that state variable. But there are other things that could not be uh, communicated this way, certainly not in this logical setting, uh, and that would typically be aspects of a temporal nature, yeah, like things that become true over the course of a sequence of communications. Um, then another aspect that, so that would not be possible in this incidental setting. Another thing that would not be in C possible in this particular setting is private communication. So if there were more than two agents, and A and B want to communicate to each other something that they want to remain secret from a third agent C, yeah? which would again be a, a typical distributed system setting, but um, um, in this logic that cannot be done because the communications are public communications, so they're all broadcasts. However, there's a generalization of this logic, and uh, well, it's you guys uh, already know called uh, action model logic that can also model private communications. But from the perspective I give here, that's a fairly natural generalization. And then diamond would not mean there is an announcement, but diamond would mean there is an action model. Um, and well, <laughs> let me say one thing about uh, this that is interesting. So, I, I didn't point this out, but this logic with um, um, quantifying over announcements is undecidable. So, you can uh, make some uh, <coughs> a very interesting uh, uh, model, and with diagonalization, you can show this. Yes, yes, we cannot uh, determine the value of this uh, or that proposition. Um, but if you quantify over, uh, over action models, this is actually a more general quantifier. And that is decidable. So in some things then will not become less complex, but at least they are decidable. Yeah. And the reason is that in quantifying over announcements, there are many gaps uh, in, in the in the might say in the in the uh, well in, in the in the sub models you consider. But once you quantify over uh, action models, you fill all the gaps. So then things become decidable. Okay. So then there's a lot more to say, but there. Are Many aspects of interest here, and they, well, at least I would hope so, they definitely relate to uh, things of interest in distributed computing. Okay, Claudio, the questions are coming a poco, for the moment, para que se escuche tu pregunta, porque estamos grabando. Yo aprovecho para decirles a quienes están conectados, well, whoever is connected, no, it's not a Spanish speaker. Uh, please uh, feel free to uh, send questions to Hans, but he will have to answer them later because we we don't have this uh, uh, chat. Oh yes, by any uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I can so, respond uh, by email. Okay, uh, Claudia, yes. for favor. 
So I think I struggled with the notion of no ability throughout the whole talk because I I wasn't so sure that anything that is true could eventually be known, like for sure. Now, I don't know if that's something that's been debated because I'm not so familiar with this, but I was thinking of two examples. So one of them is like, for instance, if I don't perceive colors as someone else, mm -hmm. even if I'm told that this apple is red, I'm not so sure that I can know, maybe I can accept that that object is in fact red, but if I have a notion of knowing that involves me actually perceiving it, then I cannot really know that something is the color it's supposed to be, even if it's announced. And my second one is maybe more political. <laughs> so consider resistance in accepting the truth of something. So for instance, if I tell you that I'm actually a trans woman, maybe some people would argue that they don't really know that I'm a trans woman because they're, they refuse to accept that. So I don't think there's like a process that would actually lead that person to, to say that they know I'm a trans woman. Because I, I mean, and there's no possible way in which even like given the thousands of announcements that person would actually know that I'm a trans woman. So I don't think that's so easy to, so I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Let me start by answering your first uh, question. Um, although I present this uh, logic of knowability in terms of knowledge, it's actually a knowledge of observability. And uh, yes, but this is not so clear for everybody. Actually, public announcement logic is even a misnomer. It should be public observability logic. Uh, because this, this announcement makes agency into logic. It's not logic of agency. There's no notion of agency. But if you cannot observe colors, then uh, clearly the distinction uh, between something that is red and green is not observable for you. Um, but of course, there is the, the, you might say, the, 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 the meta level analysis that you uh, have been told by others that these are different colors, such that uh, uh, implies that for others this is uh, observable. And so it's knowable in that, that sense, in that higher sense. But, but I thank you for this question because it points out that, um, yeah, knowable means observable. Um, well, in, in, in the meantime, answering the first question, I was trying to very hard to find uh, an intelligent uh, response to the second question. Um, what the matter is with, uh, well, people resisting to such issues, accepting, say, a transgender identity, is that, um, at, well, reducing it to the logical analysis, that they refuse to accept the information as reliable or true. So you never get to the process where you have decided to incorporate the information, the discussion at the Ramon. So, yeah, so therefore that is for a very other reason uh, outside uh, my analysis. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, for, for a completely unrelated uh, reason to transgender, this makes me think of Nancy Pelosi, who is my hero of the day. <laughs> I hope she wins. Yeah, that's good. Um, <laughs> okay. okay. So now we're moving to the left uh, corner of the room where we have two questions. Alejandro first and then Marie. Um, I, I would like to know if, if you can talk a little bit more about the lack of a finite set of axioms. Uh, because um, let, let me motivate my question. Perhaps uh, I didn't understand fully. Um, if, if you don't, don't have a manageable Calculus. Uh, my worry is uh, you might be capturing the behavior of agents, but uh, you wouldn't be telling telling us something about their mental processes or capturing their mm -hmm. their reasoning processes. Um, because agents' reasoning processes should be finitary, or mm -hmm. uh, no? Um, well, yeah, yeah, uh, not. 
Mm. Yes, I, I yeah. suppose that's my intuition. Yeah. No, no, because I think there are um, uh, philosophers in the sense of natural philosophers, I think Roger Penrose, uh, maybe, that claim that uh, even though a kernel's incompleteness theorem is a completeness theorem, we humans can understand this. So that means we actually have infinitary uh, capacities to, to understand things. So from a, a perspective of what the relation is between uh, logics and how humans reason, it's not necessarily the case that because the logic is infinitary, therefore it's not human because humans do things finitary. So that can already be contested. And on the, on the other hand, I agree that um, this, uh, well, having an infinitary axiomatization is not very practical if you want to uh, do an actual proof. Um, and so maybe this is not a very practical logic. Yeah, this is true. Yeah. It, it, it is an open question, and I cannot um, give a very clear answer to this question because um, I'm not very uh, familiar with those areas. So it, it, it has to do with, um, in fact, the theorems and the non-theorems uh, of the logic. And, and in both cases, uh, you want to uh, know whether they are, uh, well, recursively enumerable. So if they are not recursively enumerable, then your attempt to find a finitary exposition is not to fail. However, nobody has proved that this is not the case. So therefore, it's an open question. Uh, however, we know that the non-theorems are uh, uh, not recursively enumerable. Therefore, that is the basis for the undecidability result. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hi. Just raise your voice so that. Yeah. I do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I I get the impression that things such as more sentence and other philosophical examples are designed to test our intuitions about human rationale. And so I also get the impression these type of uh, formal approaches to epistemological problems are also designed to preserve our intuitions about human rationality in a sense. And so uh, when you, I, I work in philosophy of science and inconsistent science, and when you deal with inconsistency for epistemic agents, Usually, people tend to uh, rely on two different notions of acceptance. Weak acceptance and a strong acceptance. And what you were responding to, Raimundo, um, about uh, public announcement, you said public announcement usually entails or assumes any of those things, uh, a strong a, a sense of acceptance. But mm -hmm. it seems to me that it's a strong acceptance. Yes, yes. And usually, weak yeah. acceptance is uh, very useful when dealing with inconsistency. So if you want to explain why agents can reason with inconsistent statements, such as more statements, mm -hmm. then you appeal to weak acceptance. And yes. when you do that, then it is extremely explanatory. So it seems to me that any formal approach that is motivated for, by things such as the Moore sentence has to incorporate, in a sense, something like weak acceptance. And I was wondering, where is it in Logics such as uh, public announcement logics. If, if it yes, is. yes. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, it's a, <laughs> and thank you for your talk. <laughs> my pleasure. It's an it, 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 it's an excellent part. Um, and, and and indeed, exactly this point has bothered many people. Um, so and, 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 and some solutions have been proposed. So there are logics of public announcements where the Announcement is not strongly accepted, but weakly accepted. Um, in such logics, it's customary to make a distinction between belief and knowledge. And not only belief in the form of defeasible belief, but belief in the form of conviction. That you can be convinced uh, that something is true, that can be still false. So that's sort of belief. Whereas knowledge, by definition, is supposed to be true, and then you have all these problems. So in those logics, you can handle both, well, the announcements by, uh, in, in a strong sense, uh, as you say, but also in the weaker sense that, for example, in view of later uh, information that gets to you, can after all uh, disbelieve the, 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 the information you strongly believed before. But this requires more modalities, not only of knowledge, but of belief, 
and and it's uh, so a standard approach there is not to consider models with uh, well knowledge that is interpreted by equivalence relations, but to consider these equivalence relations as as total orders of more or less plausible worlds and have other modalities that represent uh, belief. Um, well, that would be a big story. How, however, um, so at least there was one uh, indeed. Uh, um, well, a, a partial uh, answer to your question about the, the difference between uh, strong and weak forms of announcement. But of course, you had an, an other relevant point, and that was the point of handling inconsistencies. Um, there are also ways to consider that, but I think the best answer to that is that I think next week we have a talk exactly on those matters by mm -hmm. Ita Ottaviano, and uh, come to that talk, I will be there too. Okay, thank you. Two more questions and then we are done, please. Uh, I think that my question was related to that uh, question from earlier. Uh, I was thinking about uh, what you had said, that uh, when you make a truth announcement in the tautological sense, and then, well, nothing happens, because what you already know remains the same, I, I was thinking in announcing uh, something which is false. On there, if if I uh, contradict, sorry, mm -hmm. right. um, and you say that uh, if I understood well, uh, all the announcements uh, are true by definition. So an inconsistency in the classical sense uh, is never true. But there are other theories which, well, it is contestable or, well, judgeable if it is true or not. Uh, and my question is, what happens when someone uh, makes a, a contradictory announcement? Because uh, is it possible to have whatever or anything as a consequence? And in that sense, uh, you have uh, told us something about the AGM uh, mm -hmm. theory, and in that sense we have a theory, and uh, sometimes new information is inconsistent with our information, uh, and then uh, it is not plausible in some sense uh, that everything follows from that. We change our theory, and then we have an explanatory uh, consequence or not. So mm -hmm. in that sense it has, uh, well, a plausible uh, theory to say that when you have public announcements which are inconsistent, then <laughs> something which is not everything follows. So we can make something or exist something because I don't know. Uh, in that sense, with public with pu public announcement or something like that. Uh, Hans, just let me phrase my question because it's a, a, a complement precisely to 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 that question. And it was, uh, as you already mentioned, I'm very interested to see the connection with the, with the AGM uh, postulates. And it was not clear to me to what extent this goes beyond theory extension in that uh, precise sense. If, the, if we give priority to the incoming information, that incoming information may be contradictory to what we already have. Mm -hmm. And my particular question complementing that is, to what extent we can retract information here okay. in order to be able to do a, a, a belief re revision uh, uh, action. Mm -hmm. um, for me, these are two different questions. Ah, so okay, okay. Have different answers. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, they, they, they are relations. But uh, so the short answer to your question is that you can do public announcement logics in logics uh, handling inconsistency of your local kind. And a nice publication on that is by Umberto Ligiecchio, who is a, an assistant professor in Natal. In, uh, he's Italian, but he, uh, he combines, uh, well, he, 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 you might say Brazil style uh, logics of inconsistency. Right? <laughs> um, <laughs> but well, going back to like uh, fitting and then stall neighbor, why not? Uh, for example, four valued uh, logics. And then the model transformation. Uh, shown here and doing this for public announcements. So then actually you interpret the public, so then you have four uh, values, uh, 
true, false, unknown, and both true and false, right? Top. And so then one way to interpret public announcements is, is model restrictions to true or top. And so uh, you want to include uh, possibly inconsistent information to be resolved later. Mm -hmm. So, so there is a way to uh, to do such dynamic epistemic logics on um, well more uh, general uh, multi-valued uh, semantics. Uh, well, at least that, that is a partial answer to your question and, and, and a pointer to somebody who has uh, worked uh, on that. Um, well, then, then I have a very different answer to your question, but that will then be related for, I hope, hopefully, the, the good reason to another aspect of your question. So instead, so one of strange thing of uh, public transport logic from the perspective of, uh, well, whether information can be trusted, is reliable, is that you sort of happily give up all your beliefs to incorporate new information, right? Even if you're... It, even if you already believe something, then bang, you believe the opposite. So you can do this, but uh, wouldn't it be uh, more wise to have some way of knowledge merging, where you weigh the things you already know against the things you might know? So uh, this way of doing dynamic epistemic logic can, from the perspective of belief bases and <coughs> information incorporation, be seen as process of merging information. Oh. And that is a currently developing theory that, well, was already an independent uh, theory, but uh, there's now, a, you might say, a, a string of such things coming out of dynamic epistemic logic. So, Alexandru Balta is in two of these matters. So, this is the one typical thing about very many that you can uh, ask him when he will be here later this year, right? So, uh, yeah. yeah. But is still, is there a way to retract things here? Yes. Or not? Okay. Yes, so the, uh, the retraction is by uh, making a distinction between, you might say, hard and soft information. You can retract soft information, not the, the hard stuff. Okay. But, but mm -hmm. the soft information might be things that you are convinced uh, to believe, and this can be retracted. And, and the, the, the mechanism to do this is not to have merely a knowledge relation, but using, uh, you might say, the distinction uh, among more or less plausible states have many uh, relations, and the restriction is with respect to one such weak relation. Of course. You have or, some uh, uh, hard, hardcore information that, 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 that you cannot move, but uh, there's, there's other type of information which is possible to, to uh, be changed. Uh, that's that's, that's yes. what you're saying. Okay. Okay, so uh, I think it's uh, uh, time to thank our speaker for accepting to give this talk.